All right, well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, why don't we get started with a few introductions and then uh, get things going in a couple of minutes just to uh, maybe give everyone a, a little bit more time to log in. Ms. Amit Singh, and yes. uh, on behalf of the VES, we wanted to welcome everyone to the inaugural, inaugural sorry, webinar of what's hopefully going to become a great series of webinars. We've had a, a just a tremendous number of re registrations from all over the world, which uh, we're really excited about. And uh, thank you all for your interest. Uh, you know, we were obviously very disappointed that we had to cancel our annual meeting this year due to the uh, COVID pandemic, but uh, we're really looking forward to future VES meetings. And in the meantime, hopefully these uh, webinars will allow current and future uh, VES members to get together virtually. Uh, so I, I just wanted to introduce our moderator and the absolute driving force behind uh, this webinar series, Dr. Chris Thompson, uh, also lovingly known as CT. Uh, CT's uh, recently become ACVS boarded. Congratulations again on that and is currently, uh, I guess, almost completing a surgical, surgical oncology fellowship at Colorado State University. Uh, he's a member of the VES Executive Committee as our website chair. And, uh, you know, fortunately for all of us, he's uh, spearheading a, a number of VES initiatives, including uh, these webinars. Uh, so uh, once again, thank you all for tuning in and uh, pass this along to CT. Thank you, Dr. Singh, uh, and I, I also just want to say thank you to everyone for the massive amount of interest that we've had in this. Um, we had almost 500 people register for our first webinar, which is uh, just totally insane. So we appreciate all of the interest and excitement about these. Um, like Dr. Meet said, we are hoping to make these a semi regular event for our members. Um, and uh, the, the plan at this point is to try and do uh, somewhere between four and six per year, depending on the interest and um, our capabilities to do so. We do have our next webinar already lined up. We don't have the definitive date scheduled just yet, um, but the plan is to do a advanced urogenital course. Um, we do have our three panelists already selected and um, they have agreed to help with this. So the current or tentative schedule is that we will have um, Dr. Bol Franson, discuss um, hormone sparing surgeries. We'll have Dr. Balsa discuss, uh, Dr. Ingrid Balsa from UC Davis discuss ovarian remnant syndrome. And we will also have um, Dr. Uh, Marilyn Dunn discussing percutaneous cystolithotomies. Um, all right, so with that in mind, we will start with um, Dr. Jackie Scott. Um, she will be discussing case selections and uh, just general ideas for everyone. So um, I'll go to Jackie Scott now. She is um, a soft tissue instructor from the University of Illinois, um, also a board of surgeon, and so she will uh, be able to go live now. Um, great. So um, I'm going to start things off and just talk about case selection, workup, preoperative considerations. Uh, with the thoracoscopic lung lobectomy. We'll talk about the difference between thoracoscopic VATS TAPS um, and how there is some confusion in the, the literature and the nomenclature about which kind of what each of these mean. Um, and the easiest way to think about it is our thoracoscopic, so our completely minimally invasive, versus our assisted techniques. And so topic and assisted techniques, we obviously have a completely minimally invasive approach versus our assisted techniques, which use a mini thoracotomy. Advantages to doing the thoracoscopic would be decreased morbidity, shorter hospitalization times, reduction in complications. Unfortunately, this is limited to larger patients. Uh, we have smaller tumors that we're able to deal with, and you do need specialized equipment and training. For the assisted technique where we're using a mini thoracotomy, you uh, don't need an endoscopic stapler. And so um, that limits that, which can be uh, quite cost prohibitive. Uh, you don't need uh, one lung ventilation, which again requires specialized training, um, anesthesia to help you out. The nice thing about the assisted is, especially for someone like myself, who's just a new brand baby new surgeon is it's a nice bridge or a stepping stone uh, while you're learning some of those thoracoscopic skills. So 
Uh, you can use it as you're honing in on working towards your completely thoracoscopic technique or vice versa. If you're starting with your thoracoscopic technique, it can be a bridge if you need to convert. So converting to an assisted technique rather than completely open. Uh, we can use this for a smaller patient. So our cats um, don't have my, um, as much uh, limitation in working space. Uh, and we can use this for larger tumors. The thing we don't know, or I guess has been, hasn't been teased out completely is how useful it is um, to assess uh, lymph node involvement for lymph node resection. So these are just some images of the assisted technique uh, from a couple of different papers. Essentially, all of them have a mini fluorocotomy between three to five centimeters. All of them are utilizing the wound retractor device, and then they have a variety of ports at different um, placements. And what you're going to do is you're going to isolate your lung lobe of interest. You're going to exteriorize it through your mini thoracotomy incision and then use a TA stapler to do your resection. So if we backstep a little bit and go, um, you know, start talking about the total thoracoscopic uh, technique again and kind of get back on track. For our case selection, we're kind of really mostly thinking about this for our primary lung lobe tumors. Uh, there are some reports looking at penetrating foreign bodies, migrating grass lawns, uh, and for spontaneous pneumothorax, so for resection of bullet and bleb. So thinking about primary lung lobe tumors first, uh, we have three main papers that I'm going to look at in regards to case selection. Uh, so the first being Lansdowne et al. in 2005. These guys had nine dogs uh, with a mean weight of 29 kilos. They made the recommendations based on the study that thoracoscopic lung lobectomy should be reserved for small masses away from the hilus. And they made a comment that the left caudal lung lobe was the easiest to perform uh, the resection on. Uh, and conversely, the right middle was the most difficult and that was associated with a limitation in working space with the instruments. Uh, about 10 years later, Blickley et al, pretty similar recommendations. Uh, they had 13 dogs, mean body weight of 28.5 kilos with tumor ranging um, in size from just over two to about seven centimeters. Uh, same thing, you know, they recommended small, small tumors are going to be uh, the kind of cases that you're looking at to do thoracoscopically. Uh, they found that the largest tumor in the study, which was seven centimeter, um, uh, seven centimeters had uh, duty margins. Mayhew et al. in 2013, uh, so these guys had uh, some case um, comparisons with an open thoracotomy group. So there's 22 dogs that were over 10 kilos um, and 24 that had, um, well, 22 that had the thoracoscopic technique and then 24 that had the open thoracotomy. Again, mean body rate around 30 kilos, uh, median tumor ratio of 1.2 centimeters squared per kilo. And they made the recommendation that really if the tumor is over 150 centimeters squared or over eight centimeters in this kind of cohort of dogs and these over 30 kilo dogs um, that really perhaps thoracoscopic is is not going to be the way to go. It did make the comment that it is a balance between the dog size and the tumor size, uh, which I think is really important based on the wide range of obviously our patient size and that it is important that the, the surgeons doing this procedure have some experience with um, uh, thoros uh, thoroscopic techniques. So to illustrate this, I have this lovely little video. Um, this is Dr. Singh uh, carefully resected his lung lobe, uh, has placed it in a specimen retrieval bag, is uh, all set to look to remove this very eager resident as I was, coming in with the blunt probe to assist, and putting a giant hole uh, in that tumor. So this is just meant to illustrate that this is a technique that uh, requires some, some training, some skills, um, and how we go about training our house officers in developing these skills and our, our own selves as surgeons, uh, I think is a super interesting topic and, and maybe one we can um, talk about in, in next year's meeting. Looking at some other reasons for doing the thoracoscopic lung lobectomy, uh, so our penetrating foreign bodies. In 2017, a multi-center study looking at pythorax um, with thoracoscopic evaluation, debridement, and lavage. 
Uh, they had one case where there was a CT consistent with a migrating grass on. Um, in this case, had a lateral uh, thoracoscopic right caudal lung lobectomy. And based on this case and uh, the others in the study, made the recommendation that really thoracoscopic approach for this should be limited to early mild cases where we only have one hemithorax affected and where that foreign body can be identified on CT. <clears throat> Looking at Boulay and Blabs, so spontaneous pneumothorax, Casey et al. in 2015, they had 12 dogs um, that they evaluated and unfortunately had a very high conversion rate. Uh, so 53% of these guys, um, they were unable to identify the leak. Um, and only 50% um, that had the thoracoscopic surgery uh, actually had successful resolution um, compared to the 83% that had conversion to median stenotomy. And the reasons that they postulated that, you know, they had such a high conversion rate, um, that they had such a high recurrence rate, was that it was quite difficult to submerge the lungs in saline. Uh, and they also had difficulty in identifying the lesion, uh, especially if it was dorsal, hyalur, or cranial. And this is in comparison to Brousseau et al. in 2003, where they had a case report of three dogs with spontaneous pneumothorax that was addressed thoracoscopically, and all of those dogs had resolution um, of the condition. And the, the thought was maybe that was because um, in one of the cases, um, they utilized carbon dioxide insufflation to gain a bit more uh, working space or a bit more compression of those, those lungs so they could identify the, the leak. So now if we think about the assisted technique and you know which kind of cases this, these are going to be appropriate for. So this is again that mini thoracotomy, a wound retractor, a couple of ports. Uh, we're mostly thinking about our primary lung load tumors. There is one case report, I, I believe out of Korea, um, where they did a, a lung load torsion. So Wombs et al. in 2014 described this technique. Uh, they had uh, some dogs and cats with a uh, weight range from just under 7 through to 30 kilos. And all of these procedures were able to be performed without one lung ventilation uh, with the assistance of a mini thoracotomy that was less than 3 centimeters. They had tumors ranging from 3 to 11 centimeters uh, with a median of 4.7 centimeters. And they made the conclusion that any tumor over 12 centimeters uh, is likely going to need an open thoracotomy. Uh, the, the paper did discuss the fact that even though they didn't assess lymph node status or lymph node, um, they didn't perform lymph node resection, uh, they did feel that it was possible and that they made the comment that they had been doing so uh, subsequently in their clinical practice. So in 2008 and 2009, um, myself, Dr. Singh and some others uh, looked at which intercostal space is going to be the, the best one to approach for this mini thoracotomy, for these assisted techniques. We found in both cats and dogs and uh, cadaver studies um, that the fifth intercostal space is going to be the best to access the hilus um, for the left and right lung lobes. Uh, whereas the sixth is going to be the best for our accessory lobe. Uh, the wee video down the bottom, um, that is just illustrating us resecting the caudal pulmonary ligament. So essentially what we're doing here is we are exteriorizing the lung lobe of interest uh, through the wound retractor device. We have a pair of medicine balm scissors that has been introduced through the same um, incision through the wound retractor. And then we're just slowly dissecting down that caudal pulmonary ligament uh, with individualization with the um, thoracoscope. As far as workup goes, these are often older, older patients. They often have concurrent conditions, obviously doing full physicals, uh, full blood work, abdominal ultrasound, thoracic radiographs, the keystone to getting our diagnosis, but really CT is going to help us define the location of the mass and to decide the side for uh, surgical approach. Our ultrasound guided FNAs can give us some information on exactly what we're dealing with, particularly obviously with those masses um, and the ultrasound guidance is, is recommended to reduce the risk for pneumothorax. And then more recently bronchoscopy has been advised as an adjunct to CT um, in identifying uh, the migrating grassles or or foreign bodies. 
So thinking about thoracic CT, we know that CT has a higher sensitivity for identifying pulmonary lesions than thoracic radiographs. Uh, we have uh, studies that have shown that CT can identify lesions down to one millimeter compared to chest radiographs, which is seven to nine millimeters, and that it's a highly sensitive uh, device to find lymphadenopathy. So based on, on these two studies, uh, the uh, Pulse on L in 2008, when they were looking at uh, planning and for um, thoracic surgery, on these tumors, uh, they said that CT was really essential in, in planning, you know, how they're going to go about doing the surgery and giving um, the owners uh, an idea about prognosis. More recently, Ruby et al. in 2020 identified that CT uh, has a higher sensitivity for identifying or being able to differentiate the difference between pulmonary versus um, mediastinal masses as well. So this is just to remind me that even though CT is great and definitely recommended for all of these cases that you're thinking about going forward uh, and doing surgery on and can definitely help us identify lymph node involvement and our primary lung load tumors for our migrating foreign bodies, uh, really we're unlikely to identify the discrete foreign body itself, um, even with CT. Most likely, we're going to see secondary signs. We're going to see low back consolidation. We're going to see cavity lesions. We're going to see bronchial obstruction and pneumothorax. For our uh, spontaneous pneumothorax, um, again, hopefully most of you are familiar that unfortunately CT actually has quite a low uh, sensitivity in being able to really isolate where those lesions are. Uh, and so that's certainly something to be mindful of and, and again helps us plan for how we're making our surgical approach. So Red Cedal in 2013 found that the positive predictive value of CT was only 50% and KCDL in 2015 found there was only a 25% agreement in lesion location between CT and surgery. Bronchoscopy, so Gibson et al. in 2019 uh, they found that there was only um, or down to a 50% agreement in some lung lobes between bronchoscopy and CT and being able to, uh, you know, isolate or locate um, plant or material. And so the recommendation was to do this concurrently to make sure we're not missing any of um, any of those lesions. Preoperative considerations. I mean, all of these patients, they have pulmonary disease, uh, how affected they are by it obviously is going to differ um, pretty significantly. Thinking about, you know, can they tolerate one lung ventilation? What, you know, what's the size of the patient? What type of one lung ventilation is going to be possible? And I know Dr. Sanchez is going to discuss that in more detail. You know, are these cases where we could consider using carbon dioxide insufflation? Do they have pulmonary effusion? Do we need to be doing thoracocentesis to stabilize? Placing thoracostomy tubes um, before surgery. Is ventilation um, going to be an issue in regards to tension pneumothorax? Antibiotic therapy, pleural lavage for our foreign bodies and, and pyothorax cases. Obviously, arterial blood gas monitoring is great. Um, I think the, the most important takeaway for me is that always being prepared for conversion. And that's just not yourself, that's the patient, making sure the clip is nice and wide, and also the owners. And that can be from thoracoscopic, converting to an assisted technique, through to converting to a completely open thoracotomy technique. So kind of summarize everything that I've been saying. If we think about the thoracoscopic uh, lung lobectomies for our case selection, there's going to be larger patients. So, you know, over 10, 15 kilos. They're going to be small peripheral masses. And Initially, this really bothered me, this idea is so ambiguous, small peripheral masses. What does this mean? I wanted a, a number, a, a, a centimeter that I could always use as a guideline. And I think it comes down to that statement in the Mayhew paper that it's a balance between our patient size and the tumor size. It, if you look at the tumor you know, of eight centimeters and you look at your patient and you think that your thoracotomy is going to be eight centimeters, then you have your answer. Um, but not being afraid, conversely, to try these out, to, to pop the scope in and say, OK, I got in there and then now I have to convert. As long as uh, everyone is on board with that, I think that's a good way, especially as, as we're setting out or as certainly as I'm setting out, uh, to gain some of that 
experience so I don't hopefully stick um, the blunt probe into another tumour. For our assisted technique, again, we have a little bit more wiggle room for patient size, a uh, bit more wiggle room for tumour size, always still doing our uh, thoracic CT and then always being prepared to convert. I think this is a, a nice technique because you can use it for, again, whilst you're learning. Um, and, you know, if you are training in, in one lung, like, like we're doing here, perhaps some of those more difficult ones to block, like our right cranial um, tumors are more difficult surgically. So, our, uh, like accessory lung lobes, this could be a technique that you can use uh, to help you with those particular cases um, as that kind of stepping stone or bridge. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good night, depending on where you are. Thanks so much for joining in. Um, my section today is going to be focused on one lung ventilation, which is a topic that I, I feel really passionate about. So my major problem was to try to summarize this in 15 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep it as practical as possible based on, you know, what we know from research and what we've done in the clinic. Um, the first question that everybody asks me when, when you know, they're introduced to this technique is why do you need to do this, right? Like you need on a specialized device, you know, the learning curve may be a little bit stiff depending on what device you're using. And the main objective of using this technique is to increase the working space and to improve the visualization during minimal invasive procedures. And, and it can really make a huge difference uh, depending on the case. So you guys can see this first video on the left. Um, this case had a left caudal lobe tumor that you can see right there in the image. And the left side is without one lung ventilation. So you can see that you can, you can visualize the tumor really well, but that's it. Uh, you don't see a lot of other structures. The image in the right is a video of the same dog after we collapse the left side. And you can see how the working space is immensely different, it's much better. The surgeon has complete visualization and access to that pulmonary ligament, making the resection and the explore much, much easier. So this is why we do it, because in some cases it makes a, a big difference for a um, surgical approach. Now, what different options or devices we have available for this? And I think everybody, when you are going to start, you know, thinking about doing this, you're going to have different options in the market. And, and the question always is, which one I get? And I think it depends a lot on, you know, equipment that you have available in the clinic and the, the type of cases that you're going to do. The main three types available are going to be the endobronchial blocker, which um, the two models that are probably in North America, I'm not sure about Europe right now, but in North America, the most commonly available commercially are going to be the ARDNT or ARNT and the EC blocker that you can see in the first two images in the left. Um, and then the double lumen tube is the one in the right upper um, corner. Um, and the last option will be probably the cheapest one or the easiest one that is a regular ET tube. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because probably is the one that we're using the least now. Um, but in our hospital, we commonly use uh, full tubes that are longer than small animal tubes. So the length is very nice and they're silicone. So they're much easier to basically um, guide to one of the bronchus, so it makes it easier. Uh, but for these ones, you always need to do the placement with a scope, with a bronchoscope, so you can see where you're guiding the tip of the tube. So which one are you going to choose? <laughs> there is no right answer. So I'm going to try to give you my perspective based on the experience that we've had. I think you need to consider different uh, problems or limitations of every device. Um, the first thing that you need to keep in mind is, are you going to do a unilateral one lung ventilation or there is a chance that you may need to switch between collapsing one side versus the other one? The only device that allows you right now to do both sides and like exchange one side for the other in the middle of the procedure is going to be the EC blocker. Um, so you can see in the lower image, it has like a V at the end with two different balloons. So you have the ability to inflate the right or the left. Um, the ARNT only allows you to do unilateral. And the other consideration that you need to you know, keep in mind with this device is you're going to be limited by the size of your ET tube. So basically, the internal diameter of that endotracheal tube. And the reason for it is that you always going to need a bronchoscope to place these type of devices. And that means that, you know, you need to add the diameter of the device to the diameter of whatever bronchoscope that you have available. 
in the website, the RN is available in three sizes. You have, um, like what they say is that the smallest size, you can use it in an ET tube that is as small as 4.5 millimeters. But that's only true if you have the smallest bronchoscope available that is 3.4. For example, we don't have that size. We have a five, which means that the smallest tube that we can place an arm through right now is around a five and a half or a six millimeters. So that's something to keep in mind. The uh, double lumen tube is the only one that you place by itself, like not through a normal endotracheal tube. But the major problem with that one is that in most cases is going to be very, very short because length is another limitation that we have. And, and you know, these limitations, I can't emphasize these enough, come from the fact that all these devices are designed for human patients, which means that they are designed keeping in mind the human anatomy. And we know that there are huge differences between the human um, airway anatomy and dogs and cats. So there's two major anatomical considerations or differences between dogs specifically in humans. The first one is the, pre the presence of a tracheolized right cranial lobar bronchus. And what this means basically that the right cranial lobo lobe just branches much cranial than in humans, sometimes even more cranial than the crina. And that makes it very, very challenging for you to be able to block that specific lobe. So if you look at this image, the blue circle will be basically where you, your balloon will sit. It doesn't matter like what device you're using. If you're using any of these three devices, it's going to sit around there. And as you can see, it's not collapsing that right cranial lobe. So, you know, you need to position it in a non-natural position where you may be able to get that right cranial lobe, but now the balloon is not sitting as stable as it should. So you have a higher risk of having failure of the technique or the balloon just displacing cranially and dislodging from the crina and having some, some problems in trouble. And this problem comes because when they designed these tubes, they didn't have this in mind because this is very uncommon in humans. So they, there is some research that says that less than 1% of children may have this problem. And in dogs, we see it very, very commonly. Um, and then the second major anatomical difference, as I mentioned before, is going to be the length. So there is some research that has done measurements of um, trachea and distance from you know, the larynx to the crina. And in humans, the mean length of the trachea is between 10 and 11 centimeters. While in dogs, there is a study that says that less than 20 kilos dog has a half a mean length of around 17 centimeters. So when you go to dogs that are larger than 20 kilos, this length is even larger, which means that the devices are significantly short for dogs, especially when you go above the 20 kilos. So keeping in mind that and the limitations of the size and the length, you know, there is a good like group in the middle of sizes where these devices are going to work. Um, now, you may have complications throughout the procedure that you need to be aware of, even if you do everything right and you think that you place it appropriately. Probably the most common complication is that the technique fails. <laughs> so, you know, you place it properly, either blindly or with a bronchoscope, depending on the technique, and then the surgeon is ready to start. When you inflame the balloon, surprise, the line is not collapsing. And this can go from complete failure where, you know, there is a huge leak and it's not sealing properly, so the line is not collapsing, to is only the right cranial lobe, the one that is not collapsing because of those problems, or is a partial collapse, or the collapse happens really slowly um, because the device doesn't have the ability to do an active collapse. So if the device doesn't have the ability to basically attach suction to it, you just need to allow the line to collapse passively. And sometimes it can take up to 20, 30 minutes for that to happen. So it's something to keep in mind. You have to sometimes give it um, a long period of time. But I think the most probably dangerous um, complication will be dislodgement. And I just did a little animation here with that balloon that I, I put before. So if you guys can see, if you have it sitting, especially in the right side at the edge of the crina, what it can happen is that with slight movement, just by surgical manipulation, ventilator, just everything, <laughs> it can happen that the device dislodges, so the balloon moves cranially. And what that can cause is either a complete obstruction of the airway or a partial obstruct obstruction of the airway. If you have a capnograph in these patients, you're going to be able to see it right away. So you detect it fast, deflate the cuff, everything is fine. But if you do not have a capnograph, it's going to be a little bit harder 
to detect and is dangerous. So we highly recommend that you always have a camera graph when you use this technique. Once you find the problem, deflate the balloon and then you can either reposition it or just abort problem solve. The last limitation that Jackie also mentioned, I think I'm going to mention in the last slide, will be the cardiorespiratory stability of the patient. So I'll touch that at the end of the presentation a little bit. And I put a video here that Dr. Singh really kindly passed to me. So you guys can see the big difference that it makes sometimes when the right cranial lobe cannot be completely blocked. So this is a video of a thoracotomy that we did at OBC, and you can see there is a tumor in the right caudal lung lobe um, and then you can see the difference in color so we place an easy blocker in this patient inflate the balloon see the difference in color the right caudal is completely collapsed it's darker but that little piece that you can see of the cranial right cranial lobe is being still ventilated so it's moving with the ventilator is much pinker and it's getting on the way of the instruments and we try our best but there was no physical way for us to block that lobe. <laughs> so sometimes even though you have almost a complete blockade, that cranial lobe can get in the way and can be a little bit of a, um, a problem for us. So I just wanted to chat a little bit more about the EC blocker specifically because um, I've been lucky enough to play with all the devices that are available right now and I think after clinical use and some research, um, we've agreed that the, the one that we prefer the most is the EC blocker because we find it easier to place and, and, and we find that it has uh, less complications. And this is based on mostly clinical experience because there is not a lot of research comparing all the devices. But uh, this one comes in a single size, um, 7 French 75 centimeters, so the length is quite good. Um, traditionally, we used to place it with bronchoscope, but now we've discovered that you can actually place it blindly and it allows for active collapse. So you can attach it to a syringe or a suction unit and just make the collapse happen faster. And because of that V at the end, we find that it lodges better at the crina. So once you inflate the balloon, we find that stays more steady. Um, that image with fluoroscope is basically what we're doing now where we're doing a blind placement and then we check uh, correct placement of the device with a single fluoroscope image. And we've been having a lot of good results with this. Um, the limitations, because again, there is no perfect device, um, are going to be, again, the size of the tube and the length. So this device, when you place it blindly, so you don't have to place a bronchoscope, it's okay for ET tubes between 6 and 14 millimeters, which is a fairly good range. Um, and the length is very good, but the problem is, um, as you can see in this image right here, that is the adapter that the device comes with and it's great. It's made specifically for it. It makes it really easy to place, but it's super long. So it takes away between 15 and 20 centimeters of that device. So it makes it effectively to be 55 to 60 centimeters. And we found that in giant breeds, um, or dogs, especially more than 40 kilos, that makes the device too short. And sometimes even if you push it all the way in, you will not reach the crina and there is no much that we can do with the devices that we have available right now. This one is the longest that we have. So this is a little video that Dr. Matthew um, passed to me where you guys can see the blind placement. So you can see how easy it is. So you just place a normal ET tube, you place the device and the natural position of the device is gonna be open with that little V open. So as soon as you pass through the ET tube, the device is going to open. And if you are in midline, it will just lodge in the crina and then you can either inflate one side or the other side. And this is how we started placing them. So you guys can see very well the balloon placement. Um, we started placing them with the bronchoscope. And this video is really good for you guys to see how you can alternate between right and left. So initially we inflated the balloon in the right um, and we had a blockade of the right. And then these dogs had multiple lesions. So we decided to have surgery that we wanted to re-expand the right and collapse the left. And we just deinflated the balloon, give a couple of good breaths and then just collapse the other side. So this is one of the big advantages of this device that allows you to do both sides. So because we have more experience probably with this device now, what have we learned um, through both research and, and clinical cases? Um, and is that first, 
um, you need to put all the ports and having the dock position and everything ready um, before you try to inflate any balloon so that you minimize the chances of the of the device moving. And then once you have everything in place, what we've learned is for the left side is not really important. But if you're trying to get a complete right blockade, you need to withdraw the device between 0.5 and 3 centimeters from the carina right there to catch the right cranial lobe if you want a complete, a complete collapse. And how much? We're still, we only have preliminary data, but it depends on the size of the dog, usually between 0.5 and 3 centimeters. And then how do you confirm that you're in the right place? You just inflate the balloon, connect a little bit of suction to the device, and then through observation, thoracoscopic observation, just make sure that the lung is collapsing. So with this technique, um, we've been placing them blindly and just checking that the device is open with a fluoroscope image. And so far we've had a fairly good success uh, with seven out of nine correct placements with this technique. And just to finish, um, because you know, I'm an anesthesiologist, so I have to speak about oxygen. <laughs> I just wanted to mention a little bit about the cardiorespiratory status of the patient. And I think there are two different, um, you know, lines of thoughts here. One is what, what we've seen in healthy research dogs, and the other thing is what we see sometimes in clinical cases. So as Jackie said, you know, it's not the same to do this technique in an animal that is completely healthy versus an animal that has, uh, you know, significant pulmonary disease and is already struggling with oxygen oxygenation or it has other comorbidities like pleural effusion or any other cardiac disease, any other problem. So what we've seen in healthy dogs is that when you do this technique, you collapse one lung, great, but you're collapsing one lung, so something has to happen. And what it happens is that your arterial oxygen decreases and your CO2 increases. And that happens in all the dogs every time that you do this technique. What we've seen in the cardiovascular side is that these patients are still preserve cardiac index quite well. So it doesn't affect the oxygen delivery. So it's great. So healthy dogs, they cope really with, with really well with, with it. They can be collapsed for, you know, there is no maximum time, but a lot of times we've had them collapse for up to an hour and they do great. So you guys can see these blood gases are actually from a PRAA puppy that we did recently. And I thought it was a super good example to see what to expect. So we always place arterial lines in these dogs and we monitor arterial gases. These are the CO2 and the oxygen levels that she had before we did the one lung. And you can see the CO2 is normal and the oxygen is great, is more than 500. For any of you guys that are not familiarized with blood gases, arterial blood gases, the normal oxygen levels are anywhere between 300 and 500. So it's great. Um, we did, we placed an EC blocker, we collapsed the left side, it went really well. 30 minutes after, this is what the blood gas was saying. The CO2 increased to 63, 66, which it was expected, and the PO2 decreased very significantly. Like it went from five, more than 500 to 164. But an awake animal breathing room air has around 100. So we're still above what is normal, and we're still on a level that you know you can keep for as long as you want with no consequences. So as long as it doesn't go lower than this, this puppy can be blocked for whatever period of time, and she was blocked for around an hour. She did great. When we finished, we re-expanded the lungs. Perfect. The situation may be a little bit different if you have an animal that is already hypoxemic to start with. So, you know, I think this requires communication between ICU, surgery, and anesthesia to see if this is a good candidate to do this technique. But in general, any hypoxemia or hypercamia happening before may make this technique challenging. Very long anesthesias, um, you know, if there is a lot of diagnostics involved before um, they go for surgery, they tend to get more atelectastic, and if the lungs are not healthy, they're going to be more predisposed to this. When this happens and they get hypoxemic, what we commonly see is an increase in heart rate and the animal gets tachypneic. So it makes the surgery much more challenging. So sometimes, you know, to try this technique when you know that the animal is not going to be stable, it may be counterproductive. Um, so, you know, to, to select the patients well is important before you jump into doing this technique. And just to finish, I think, you know, what is next for us in research? And I think 
the most natural next step for us is to move away from the human devices that we know that have a lot of limitations and basically design a device that is going to be specific for the airway anatomy of dogs and cats. Like cats right now, we don't have any device that works for them. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. We're doing a lot of 3D CT measurements and, and some anatomical studies um, to try to work with a company and design devices that may be specific for dogs and cats and that we can place easier and are more, more efficient at, at what we want them to do. And that's it. I don't know if you guys have any questions or. It's right eventually, Chris, don't worry. <laughs> good, and your screen is working, so you should be good to go. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for, to Chris for putting in like 100 hours of, of uh, time in getting the less IT savvy of us uh, up to speed here. So um, let's crack on because uh, we're doing a lot of talking and it'd be great to have some time for discussion. Um, I'm going to sort of mainly talk about VAT lobectomy, so or, to, or thoracoscopic or total thoracoscopic lobectomy. Um, Jackie did a really nice job of talking about the VATS assisted approach, and the VATS assisted approach is a fantastic approach, um, especially for those smaller patients. It's great in in the earlier part of your learning curve, and honestly, it's it may be it may very well be the better technique if you're in a center where you don't have the luxury of having a Dr. Sanchez on your staff who uh, you know is passionate about one lung ventilation and things like that because honestly one lung ventilation is the biggest challenge to getting centers um, uh, up to speed on being able to do a totally lab, uh, a totally thoracoscopic approach to a lobectomy because honestly I've tried over the years um, to do a total lobectomy thoracoscopically with uh, perhaps a low tidal volume or perhaps some CO2 insufflation or whatever. And we'll talk about that. Uh, I'll touch on um, some of those topics that Dr. Sanchez talked about already. But at the end of the day, you really do need complete atelectasis to do most um, total thoracoscopic lung, uh, lung lobectomies in dogs, in my experience. It's hard, even with a little bit of ventilation. Uh, if you don't have atelectasis, I find it pretty hard. But let's go through a few of the topics. And this is kind of, this is sort of, I've, I've, I've looked at this presentation as sort of what, you know, tips of what I've learned over the years. And, and this is all, uh, you know, a lot of this opinion based and, and um, please chime in my fellow presenters if you disagree or whatever. Uh, but this is kind of the how I do things um, kind of approach. So let's talk about access to start with. So for the most part, um, when I uh, approach one of these, I'm going to put my first port in thinking that that's going to be my camera portal position. And I'm usually going to go mid-level into costal space. So uh, not super dorsal, not super ventral, mid-level. Um, and I'm going to follow those guidelines that, that um, you know, Eric was probably the first one to write about, uh, where if you're doing caudal lobes, you're going to put them quite cranially. So maybe five or six, something like that. If you're doing cranial lobes, you're going to put them quite caudal. And the reason for that is you don't want to be too close to your pulmonary hilus. Um, the biggest reason reason being that your stapler is a big device and especially if we're using some of the longer staple cartridges which is what we usually recommend the 45s and the 60s you know you need space to open that thing up physically because if even if 10% of it is still in your port uh, or your trocar it's not going to open up and so we need to be far away from those and what I do and this is true for most thoracoscopic procedures not just lung lobectomy but I look at that first port as being my exploratory port so I'm going to put the camera in I'm going to take a look around see where the lie of the land is the layer of the land is I'm going to look at my pulmonary hilus and I'm going to decide you know am I in a a, a good location for my scope and where perhaps might the best trajectory be for my stapler to come up um, and get that hilus. And that's something that I've sort of evolved on over the years through some of the research we've done and the clinical cases we've done. Second port is probably going to be in the same intercostal space. And I'm just looking at that port as being um, a port that's probably going to be for my probe or my retractor or whatever. Uh, so that's usually going to be in the same intercostal space. I like that idea because then if I am converting to an intercostal thoracotomy, I'm basically joining incisions and I'm not leaving the dog with extra incisions, so to speak. Uh, beware of going too dorsal in the intercostal space with that port because the higher up you get, 
the narrower together the ribs are and you you lose the ability to really um, create a lot of angulation on those trocars if they're very very dorsal and then the stapler port is kind of the most critical port right because we want to optimize the trajectory on our pulmonary hilus okay now i know some people and and uh, eric's talked about this keeping the stapler in the same intercostal space and that again is really attractive option because then if you do convert you're just joining incision to incision to incision and that's that's um uh, a very very attractive option i over the years i've sort of morphed a little bit on that and i kind of like my stapler to come in from a more ventral location so usually um, my stapler is going to be one to two intercostal spaces, cranial if it's a cranial lobe or caudal if it's a caudal lobe to the intercostal space that my camera is in. And I'll show you some pictures if that wasn't entirely clear. Um, and that gives me a little bit of triangulation. And, and critically, it's coming in usually ventral because what I want to do is I want I want that pulmonary, I want that stapler to come in um, uh, essentially from from bottom to top and I'll show you some videos of that in a second don't worry about putting extra ports in you know if if you if any of you guys have um, needle scopic or the or the pediatric ports it's especially attractive to easily add more ports because if you're dealing with two or three millimeter ports you don't even have to close those incisions and so really those, those are sort of freebie ports um, and you can put an extra one of those in no problem I do that a lot with these kind of complicated cases I do it a lot I did an adrenalectomy yesterday I popped in a two millimeter extra port and it's sort of a free port that all it's going to require to close is one drop of, of uh, tissue glue and we do that sometimes with lungs as well and don't worry if you don't have those pediatric ports no big deal to put an extra five or six millimeter port in um, either so these are the pictures from the salt book you know uh, that eric wrote very nice chapter on a few years ago we're working on the second edition of that now uh, and showing uh, most of those ports coming in at the same intercostal space so again reiterating the point that if you're going cranial uh, or perhaps middle lobes usually we're going to back up we're going to go in at sort of eight or nine intercostal space something like that if we're doing caudal lobes we're probably going to be at five or maybe six something like that okay um what i tend to do is is this um so here perhaps on the left on the uh, uh, in that image you can see um that mid thoracic um uh trocar is going to be for my telescope uh, maybe i'm going to put in the the probe underneath there but notice my stapler port is coming in uh, one or two spaces more caudal and it's coming in from underneath it's coming in from ventral okay okay um so a couple of years ago uh the project that got never that never got finished uh jeff and uh, Mead and i uh met a few times in different institutions partly for for uh, beer and food and partly to do research and we did this kind of wacky project that we haven't yet finished we swear we're going to finish this one day uh but it was kind of educational so we put in ports at all the different intercostal spaces dorsal middle ventral um and try to figure out the best trajectory for that stapler port and again we haven't crunched the numbers on this um but essentially um it see th this sort of gave me an inclination that coming in from ventral was a more attractive option um and uh you know that that has sort of stuck translating that into the clinic that has also uh, been my uh, sort of take on on uh, doing the cases clinically this was the one position that didn't work out and physically Jeff runs probably the only person who can pull this off because my arms don't go this wide all right so extra needle scopic ports here you go this is the two millimeter port going in here you can see uh, and that is really very very innocuous the, the the owners won't even see that incision probably so you can do that very easily without you know really causing your your dog uh, or cat any extra problems at all all right so this is uh, i don't know if audio is going to play here chris because i think this video has audio but i'm a huge fan of optical entry and i do this with the storts um endo tip cannuli okay so what we're doing here my end um i don't know if i can speak over this or not but uh what i'm going to do is small incision endo tip uh cannula goes in um and then i do a couple of turns to seat that cannula in position and then my scope will go into the cannula uh uh, and I will watch myself penetrate through the layers. And you can do this also, the medical device companies, Ethicon, Medtronic have these really nice optical entry cannulae. They're kind of expensive. This is sort of the poor man's uh, version of this. And what I'm doing is as I'm screwing that 
um, that cannula in, I'm watching the layers and you can see yourself penetrate the pleura in real time. Now notice that the image is offset on the video because this is a 30 degree scope, okay? But I think you'll agree that once we go through and we penetrate, you can see us penetrating through the muscle fibers because this is a trochar-less cannula, okay? It, it operates, it works by splitting the muscle fibers. And then as soon as we see that pleura of the, the, the pleura uh, being penetrated, we can see those little capillaries on the lung surface, and we have a very nice controlled entry. And so that, for me, is is sort of a uh, a really nice technique, and that's definitely my go-to for entry. All right, so let's talk about working space management. I'm not going to repeat. I don't want to repeat anything that Dr. Sanchez said because she's the expert in that area. But for me, if you're doing a um, a, a total thoracoscopic lung lobectomy, you sort of in your brain need a, a sort of a working space management plan, okay? And and discuss this with anesthesia ahead of time. And I, it is the case that for the most part, if you really want to get into this, you need to master the art of one lung ventilation, and you need to master multiple devices because um, those different devices that Dr. Sanchez mentioned, the easy blocker, the, the aunt endobronchial blocker, um, and we use double lumen uh, endobronchial tubes quite a bit. The big limitation there is that they're short, so you won't be able to use them in dogs more than about 25 to 30 kilograms, unfortunately. We are working, as she mentioned, on, on partnering with industry to create longer double lumen tubes. The beautiful thing about double lumen tubes is you can put them into the left side, and you can ventilate, uh, ventilate either the left or the right side. So if you can get a left-sided tube placed uh, and you have a right-sided lesion, you don't have to bother with that whole tracheal bronchus thing on the right cranial lobe um, if you can get them in the right position. So there may be some advantages to that device. But what I do when I go into the chest cavity, and again, this is true for almost all thoracoscopy cases, whether we're doing a thymoma, a lung, whatever, is I'll go in, I'll penetrate like I just showed you on the video, and then I usually almost immediately ask the anesthesiologist to stop breathing, okay? And that gives me, um, you know, 30 seconds or a minute to just find my feet, so to speak. I look around, I'm like, okay, there's diaphragm, you know, there's the other lung lobes, there are the, there are, you know, there, there's the, um, the, the mediastinum, whatever procedure I, it is. Um, I give myself that working space by ceasing ventilation. And then uh, once I kind of know where I am um, and I'm happy, uh, I let the anesthesia people start ventilating again and I get, allow my brain to get a sense of where things are. OK, and that usually involves dropping your hand down. So elevating the scope in the chest cavity, looking over lungs and sort of figuring out um, where everything is. Now, there are a bunch of different techniques we can use apart from one lung ventilation. And, uh, and one of the things I do a lot of procedures under is is just a decrease in tidal volume. That's a relatively easy thing if you've got relatively healthy lobes. Uh, we did a chylothorax yesterday and we did the, the thoracic duct ligation just by dropping the tidal volume down. We had excellent visualization. I think most of us would agree that for thoracic duct ligation, you don't need one lung ventilation, okay? Talk to anesthesia about PEEP management. PEEP management is this ongoing joke that we have with our anesthesia service because uh, anesthetists love PEEP for all sorts of very, very important uh, physiological reasons, right? It improves oxygenation and so forth. But PEEP, I know almost instinctively if the anesthesia people have PEEP on because uh, and especially if they turn it on halfway through a procedure, because it, you know, uh, it creates that partial, um, uh, uh, that partial ventilation of alveoli. And so immediately the lung volume increases and it robs you of, um, it robs the surgeon of uh, working space. OK, and so if you have a dog that's already on the tight side working space wise and you add peep in, you're going to know all about it. And so I'm always joking with my anesthesia people saying, ah, oh, did you sneak that peep on me? You know, and so I usually ask them to turn it off if they can live without it. But of course, they have very, very good reasons to initiate peep. Um, short, series, short period of CO2 insufflation uh, to working space. I think a lot of people are, are using CO2 insufflation more and more nowadays. It got a lot of bad press initially because the early papers looked at pretty high pressures of CO2 insufflation and often for prolonged periods. Because in humans, for CO2 insufflation to be uh, useful, they actually have to go to quite high pressures, you know, 8 and 10 and 12 millimeters of mercury. A lot of those studies were done over 30 or 45 or even an hour of period of time. And, you know, if you do that to a dog, that you're, we're probably going to get catastrophic um, 
uh, cardiopulmonary consequences from that, but as a technique to give you improved visualization to, to get your bearings for maybe a minute or two minutes or something, um, it's actually a great technique and generally fairly well tolerated, especially in cats, okay? And so we use that a lot um, for short periods of time just to sort of improve things. It's great for things like pericardectomy where perhaps you don't need one lung ventilation, but you want a little bit more um, working space, things like that. So big problem is we got these different breeds, right? So I can tell you, if you go in your high thoracic depth, those of you who haven't done a lot of thoracoscopy yet, you go into your your uh, your setters and your Dobermans and things like that, you're going to have this luxury situation where you naturally, even just with a pneumothorax, have a ton of working space. And then the first time you put um, uh, uh, put a scope into an English bulldog's chest because of one of those pericardial effusions, you're going to be very frustrated because you've just you've got so little space and you can't see a thing. That's just natural breed variation. So a pericardectomy. Um, is something that most of us are not going to be uh, doing one lung ventilation for these days. Uh, but an English bulldog, I'm still talking to my anesthesia people about one lung ventilation for a pericardectomy because I can tell you there's there's zero room in there. OK, um, so that's a big thing to consider what kind of patient we're dealing with. So light, low tidal volume management is is super helpful for a lot of interventions. So here's one of Dr. Bolsa's, one of my colleagues here at Davis, one of her videos uh, of a thymoma that she was resecting. And you can see uh, I don't want you to look at the thymoma dissection. I want you to look at what the lungs are doing. OK, so this dog is being ventilated, but there's almost no um, lung excursions here and it's allowing um, Ingrid to work in this pretty tight space but get on with the job um, because the lungs are not um, demonstrating a lot of excursions and most of our thoracoscopy patients don't have chronic cardiopulmonary disease right even the big primary lung tumors generally speaking the rest of their lung is perfectly healthy so they tolerate uh, they tolerate this pretty well so you've got a lot of latitude um, just by doing that okay um, this is see there's some pictures from co2 insufflation in cats from a study we did a few years ago and you can see I, i'm i'm always very surprised at how dramatic the increase in working space is even with uh three millimeters of mercury of co2 look at the, the cat's chest with three millimeters of mercury of co2 in it compared to the one on the left side with baseline which is no no insufflation you get a dramatically improved working space the problem remains though if you're doing lung surgery and you want to resect a lung lobe this is still going to be difficult to do because co2 insufflation is just pushing away our lungs it's not causing atelectasis so once you start trying to get a even in the images uh, on the right with the insufflation when you start get trying to get a stapler around a lung lobe hilus it's still difficult to do that and so one lung ventilation is not going to be replaced for lung surgery by co2 insufflation anytime soon uh, at least um, that's the take i've been getting from the cases i've done all right, so first thing we are going to have to do, if we're doing a caudal lobe or an accessory lobe, we've got to deal with that pesky pulmonary ligament, okay? We like it because it stops our caudal lobes from torsing, but we don't like it when we have to take those lobes out, okay? There's a few different ways of doing that. If, you, if it's a very avascular structure, you know, you can just cut through it sharply. It doesn't really bleed a whole lot, but to get scissors in there or the ligature in there, um, you know, you do need to be coming from caudal. So notice that scissor is probably coming from something like an eighth intercostal port or something, and we said that you know we want to keep those ports nice and cranial so um you know in the early days I, I i did often put a caudal port in just to allow myself to incise this pulmonary ligament when you're doing that be careful obviously because as you get down to the base of the hilus um the first structure you encounter is the pulmonary vein normally and you don't want to be cutting into that pulmonary vein but nowadays um what i tend to do is i tend to do this with the j hook uh because the j hook can get into these very very tight spaces so this is j hook monopolar electrosurgery probes they're, they're very cheap you can just put them onto your regular cautery pencils and you can get into these little nooks and crannies you can pull away uh pull that pulmonary ligament away from surrounding structures and then just give very very small doses of uh the energy to come through it get you better hemostasis and critically the reason i really like it is that i can do that from one of my cranially located ports because i can pull the thing backwards whereas if i did it with a scissor um i'm at the wrong angle to do that i mean i suppose i could poke a hole in it and cut backwards but i find that a little bit easier to do with the j hook all right so if you're going to do this 
Most of us are going to do this with surg surgical staplers. Dr. Ehara gave a really cool presentation at our last BES meeting where he dissected out uh, the, the, the artery vein and, and bronchus uh, in very small dogs. Uh, that's an extremely high skill uh, thing to do and not something I've attempted. Um, and, and I prefer to do this with staplers if I can. Um, and uh, for the most part, you know, this is a very dynamic area in terms of what's going on with industry right now. We're still using the standard endo GIA, which is a Medtronic product, but that stapler has been discontinued now. Okay, the old style endo GIA stapler. We still have a bunch of them, so we haven't moved on from those yet. Um, but the, the nice thing about these staplers is they've got six rows of staples. They've got a blade in between. And for the most part, um, I do what, um, what Eric uh, described with his first papers of this technique, which is using the blue stapler, which is a three and a half millimeter staple that closes to one and a half. That works great for a very large variety of sizes. So anything from 15 kilograms up to, you know, Great Dane, I've used that blue stapler and touch wood, I've had uh, really very few problems with bleeding or air leakage or anything like that. I, I haven't had a case that's done that in a, at least in a catastrophic way um, using that stapler. So that that's great because it allows you to keep one size of stapler on the shelf. Now you may want to use different lengths and these come in 30, 45 or 60 millimeters. We tend to keep the 60 millimeter lengths and maybe one of the smaller length um, sizes. Uh, but if you, you know, it's difficult to have all the different stapler cartridges. You gotta buy, you gotta, you gotta buy boxes of six of them. It's a lot of inventory, a lot of money to have on the shelf. Okay. Now the problem with this is that stapler technology is advancing constantly. And so these big medical device companies are constantly bringing out new staplers. The cost is increasing uh, and that's making life a little bit difficult for us veterinarians trying to make these procedures economical. So Medtronic's latest generation of, of um, staple cartridges are called the tri-staple. Um, and uh, that's a, a new innovation that has different size staples. And I'll come to the advantages and disadvantages of that. Also a six row stapler. The Echelon Flex is the Ethicon product. Um, the Eth Ethicon have a, a really wide range of these different staplers. So if you try and research that, it's actually kind of complicated to figure out which one you need to use, but I think um, if I was going to use those, I'd probably use their blue cartridge, which is a 3.6 um, staple leg length. They also have a white cartridge, which is two and a half. Uh, Medtronic has one of those as well. I haven't used the, the vascular uh, white cartridge for um, lung lobectomies. Uh, I've generally used the blue one, which would now in the tri-staple format be the purple cartridge, and I've had very good experience with that, so I haven't felt a need to sort of change those. But these new generation staplers, are, they're pretty awesome um, in, in that they have set several advantages. The tri-staple technology, what they did is they all, they differ, they, they made different size staples. So the six rows of staples are not all the same length. And the one that um, would generally be used for, for our size patients would be the purple, which is which has an inner three millimeter staple, middle is three and a half, outer is four, perceived advantages or, or, or uh, you know, uh, adv documented advantages of that is that generates less stress on the tissue, greater perfusion to the margin because the outer uh, staple is not causing as much crushing of tissue, presumably allowing more perfusion in. And then uh, also um, better use potentially in variable thickness tissue, which is what we're asking it to do, right? We're asking it to seal a bronchus as well as a thin, uh, thin walled vein. Um, you know, so there should be advantages there. Although I will say I've touch wood had very, very few problems with the traditional conventional endo GIA, which has the same size staplers. Now, one of the things that's happening now is that they use they're creating powered staplers. So they actually have a motor in them that advances the stapler for you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not as if it's hard work to advance the stapler, but any of you that have used the endo GIA, you know, there is a real crunching sensation as it goes through the tissue. The powered might be a nice advantage for that. Medtronic has a product now called the Signia, which actually has an LED screen and has this um, essentially, essentially uh, an intelligent staple um, system that reads the pressure that the staplers are putting on and creates a feedback system. I haven't used that device. I can only imagine how expensive that is, but the problem the problem is that the cost is increasing as all of these cool new advantages come out, and that is um, presenting a little bit of a problem for us to uh, make these procedures affordable. There are other companies now on the horizon. There are some Chinese companies that are making some staplers and stuff. So this is a dynamic area and you need to keep up to date on, um, you know, and figure out cost wise uh, whether those advantages are, are worth it to you or not. 
there is also a five millimeter stapler. It's made by a, a pediatric human surgical company called the Just Right. I've used this in open feline thoracotomies. I haven't yet used it for a, a thoracoscopic case. It only has four rows of staples. It's a two millimeter leg length device and it's only 25 millimeters long. So this might be something uh, that would be helpful to us, but it's only gonna be restricted to fairly small dogs and cats, which is an area I would like to have a device for, for the, because the 12 millimeter endoJA is usually too big for those patients, uh, but it's also expensive. It's like $400 a cartridge, so uh, not cheap either, but that is out there as well. All right, so some tips for actually uh, completing the, your resection. One of the big things I always tell our residents um, is, you know, I really wanna see both ends of the stapler uh, with my scope, okay? If, if I put the, the, the endo-GIA around the, the, around the pulmonary hilus, you know, I'd really like to at least set eyes on the blue end as well as on the, uh, the, the, the other end around either side. And so that's why we love 30 degree scopes for these cases, because we, we have the ability to look around corners and so forth. But I'm, kinda, I'm, I'm gonna wanna always do that before I set my staples down and certainly before I fire, because I don't want that blue uh, end to be caught in a remnant of a pulmonary ligament or, or whatever. And what this slide also demonstrates is that you, you very, because of the length of these devices, you will very often but be bumping up against against anatomical structures. In this case, we're bumping up against the rib cage. And so um, you have to think about, in terms of getting the, the lung lobe into your staple device, you know, the, the our sort of natural instinct is always to push the stapler further in to try and capture more tissue. Well, you often don't have that luxury. And so think about it the opposite way. You have to actually get the lung tissue back into your stapler. Um, and there's a few ways that you can do that because none of us want to expend two cartridges, three cartridges, uh, because it gets very expensive if these cartridges are two, three, four hundred dollars each. We want to minimize the number of cartridges that we use. And for those of you that haven't used these cartridges, they're not like TA cartridges where you can lock the tissue into your stapler head. They are a V shape that comes together. And as it comes together, the lung tissue inevitably gets pushed out of the cartridge. OK, so I'm going to show you some some good techniques and some bad techniques. Uh, I'd like to say that this is a video from one of my colleagues, but it's not. It's one of my early cases, probably 10 years old. And there's a couple of mistakes in here. So I'm handling this lung lobe. I got to tell you, I do not I, I have I, I do not handle lung or any other delicate tissues uh, very much anymore in laparoscopy or in thoracoscopy, because what happens is you inevitably damage the tissue, okay? You'll see uh, me damaging this lung lobe here. It creates a bloody field for you. It potentially breaks surgical oncological rules, right? And so what I tend to do, and, and uh, I do this with lung, I do this with adrenals as well, I'm gonna manipulate these lesions and these lung lobes with instruments, but I'm gonna do my best not to grab them, because generally speaking, Speaking, I regret that. So that's one um, one uh, poor technique item from this video. The other thing I don't like about this this um, uh, what I'm doing here is that my stapler, you can see, is coming in from a very cranial angle. Okay, so if I did this case again, I would reverse my camera and I would put it in that staple port, and I would have my stapler coming in from underneath. OK, so what you notice there is coming in from cranial, I had interference of my cranial lobes. So I had my my cranial lobes were getting in the way they were sort of feeding themselves into the stapler, which I don't like. OK, and also I think my angle coming in from cranial is creating um, a longer trajectory for the stapler, possibly uh, making me require um, uh, I'll just run that again as I speak, making me require more staple uh, cartridge discharges. Um, but also to be able to follow that rule where I see both tips of my stapler on either side, what I have to do here is I have to lift that lobe up, uh, which is a very heavy lobe. It's a caudal lobe. It's a very heavy lobe in itself, and it's also got a tumor in it. So it's it's a lot of weight, and that's contributing to me damaging that tissue. Okay. So what I would do nowadays is I would have the stapler coming in from ventral, okay, from maybe a seventh intercostal space, something like that. And I would be coming um, uh, perpendicular to the angle that I'm coming in now. And that way, the lobe is gonna flop over the back of my cartridge. And hopefully I can go up and see the two ends of my uh, stapler um, up by the rib cage this time. And again, I'm not gonna have the interference of that cranial lobe trying to sneak its way into my, my stapler cartridge, okay? All right, so another thing I do is, is again, in an effort to minimize uh, cartridge use, 
Um, I try and I have this little U retractor, which I, I got years ago. I've re-sterilized it probably 20 times. Um, and I sort of try and, and it, that you don't have to do this with, um, with the U retractor, uh, but um, it works pretty well for that purpose. I try and hold the lung tissue into the stapler cartridge. OK, now I wasn't entirely successful in this case, as you'll see. So you can see one of the big frustrations of of um, total uh, uh, thoracoscopic lobectomy is this slippage of lung tissue out of the stapler. OK, um, but I do my best to hold that tissue in. I crush down, I run the stapler and then I, uh, I sometimes get away with one cartridge and occasionally I have a little remnant left which I can deal with. But that sometimes does involve um, a second cartridge. But that's one technique you can use for trying to hold that tissue um, in. So what do I do with that little remnant, which happens all too frequently, unfortunately? So if my staples, remember the stapler is going to um, staple beyond the cut line. So you're going to have staples Staples that have gone beyond the level at which the blade has gone. And so what you might end up with the situation on the left, right, where my staples have clearly gone all the way across that lobe. And if that's the case, I feel pretty good about just taking the old scissor in there and just cutting through that last tag of tissue. OK, uh, and I do that. I don't get any uh, major issues with that because my staples have gone uh, beyond. And that's great. OK, no more money spent. Um, going back to that lesion I showed you, um, what this video shows, one thing this video shows, which is good, is that the staplers are remarkably good instruments because you'll see when I fire this stapler, it ends right on the pulmonary artery. So if that thing was going to blow on me, it would have blown on me. But that endogia is a very, very good instrument. Whoever designed that thing did a good job. But what I've got in this case is a very significant piece of tissue left with, with artery going through it. So that's going to be an indication for a second cartridge. I'm not going to rely on any other technique. I'm going to rely on another stapler cartridge. I'm going to suck it up, spend the money and get it done. Other techniques you can use if you have a little piece of tissue left, maybe a couple of hemoclips on there. Just be careful not to put metal on metal. Try and avoid the, you know, putting hemoclips on the staple. Uh, maybe an endo loop. I've done that as well on that last little bit of tissue. Those are all techniques you can use for getting rid of that last little bit. All right. So what about this is sort of going back to case selection um, that uh, Jackie uh, touched on as well. But, you know, um, the, the original advice from Eric's early papers on this was that whole thing about small lesions away from the hilus. And that's great advice. And, and that's what you should do when you're starting out your learning curve with these cases. But there are lesions that are more challenging. There are bigger lesions and there are limits to everything we could do. I think as we're, we're failing minimally invasive surgery if we say that, you know, if we start with the bravado of saying, oh, we can do everything, we can do everything as well, and what have you. Our job is to, you know, really use evidence-based medicine to come up with um, good recommendations because minimally invasive surgery is only ever going to be a good approach for a subset of cases, right? We all have seen the really big lesions. Now, one of those categories of more difficult locations is the cranial lobes. And, you know, vast majority of primary lung tumors are in the caudal lobes. So uh, my uh, image file of caudal lobectomies is much, much larger than my image file of cranial lobectomies. Um, and with cranial lobectomies, um, I have come in from a caudal location on, on um, a number of occasions. And you can do cranial lobectomies but the, the, the area is a little tighter, okay? And so again, makes it all the more important to get really good, complete one lung ventilation. And that video that um, uh, Dr. Sanchez showed of um, that lung lesion where they were tr gonna try and do a lung lobe resection of the caudal lobe with the cranial lobe inflating, that's often a thing that I've spoken to anesthesia about when they struggle to get that cranial lobe, especially on the right, deflated, it is very difficult to do any kind of lung lobectomy if you have a major lobe still inflated. So you are going to have to do something um, to try and drop that cranial lobe down. And in my hands, um, uh, I'm going to probably use a double lumen endobronchial tube placed in the left side if I have a right cranial uh, lesion, uh, because that's going to get me away from trouble, um, uh, you know, with that right cranial lobar bronchus. So here's a here's one where you can see we've got the endo GIA on here uh, and we've got we've taken down a cranial lobe, uh, but that is a little bit of a tighter space. The nice thing about the cranial lobes is there's no pulmonary ligament. So uh, you have you don't have to spend the first 20 minutes of your procedure taking down that uh, pulmonary ligament. You can go straight in there and uh, start, um, you know, uh, getting your trajectory sorted out for your stapler. Um, all right, so here's one. 
Again, we're going to use that um, uh, that Euro tractor. Try and hold this in because here we stand a real chance of getting away. You know, this is a small pulmonary hilus, cranial lobes, much smaller, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, you know, this is on the left side, and I'm going to use that to try and keep my lobe in there and stop it from creeping out as the stapler deploys. Um, and in this case, I was successful in doing that. Now, maybe I could do that. Maybe that would have happened anyway without uh, my U retractor in there. But it's nice to I, I find it helpful to, to get that in there uh, to try and um, hold things in position while I uh, get that done. And, and notice, you know, we're pretty much always doing a complete lobectomy. I, I almost always do a complete lobectomy. If I had a small bulla or something like that I was treating, uh, maybe I would uh, do a, a peripheral lobectomy. But stapling of the hilus, I think, is a more secure closure of a lung lobe. And I've had uh, more, many, uh, I don't know about many, but I've definitely had a number of lung lobectomies where you get those pathology reports when you submit the entire lobe that not only was there the primary pulmonary mass that you knew about, but there were also intralobar metastasis uh, in other areas of the lobe. And so for me, anything neoplastic is a complete lobectomy. Uh, and you can get really tight on these lung lobes. I mean, I think you guys will agree, you know, there's very little pulmonary tissue left um, at that location. And I think most of us feel pretty comfortable, uh, comfortable now. Now that we are doing just as thorough of a job with complete lobectomy with um, with thoracoscopic uh, resection as we are with open resection. You can get nice and tight on those lung lobes. All right, here's another one. This was um, this is sort of uh, to, to, to uh, stoke uh, uh, thinking about the ones that are closer to the hilus. And um, I think Jackie mentioned it. Uh, the fact that, you know, when you're going in, uh, putting the scope in initially, uh, you're usually putting the scope in, uh, especially with caudal lobes, you're putting the scope in at the location you're going to do your thoracotomy anyway. So you haven't lost a great deal unless you spend, you know, an hour looking around. But you haven't lost a great deal by putting that fifth intercostal scope port in, taking a look at this lesion and making a five to ten minute decision as to whether you think it's feasible to take out. OK, so there's not a great deal lost by maybe putting one port in, maybe putting a second port in for a blunt probe, having a look, um, seeing uh, whether you think you can get it. And this was sort of in that category. Um, so there's a big dog. So we know we're going to have some space here. OK, as we run through, we can see the lesion uh, pretty close to the hilus, not a huge lesion, but not in a great location. Definitely doesn't um, def definitely doesn't call um, uh, fall into that category of small peripheral lesion. OK, uh, and I sort of went with that theory of let's take a look at this thing. OK, so we took a look at this thing um, and when we got in there, thankfully, we got nice one lung ventilation going. Uh, the first thing we saw is some adhesions of the lung lobe onto the diaphragm, but we took those down pretty easily. And, you know, lo and behold, there was a pretty nice trajectory uh, that I felt like was very tight on the pulmonary hilus. So I didn't feel like I was compromising uh, my resection in any way. I was able to come through there pretty quickly. And so even this, even though this uh, lesion was very close to the hilus, um, I, I was able to get in there and do what I felt like was a, a pretty good tight uh, resection that didn't in any way compromise my oncological principles with this case. Now, by of course, the next three of these that I see might be different. and We might have mass that's sort of glommed onto the hilus without that nice trajectory for our stapler to go through. But just to use this as an example to say, you know, not every one of these cases is a deal breaker. You can go in and take a look and see what you think. And there again, I have my pesky little remnant there. I didn't feel good enough about uh, leaving that without further staples. Uh, so I went in and put a second cartridge on there. Now, remember, if you're doing the second cartridge, make sure that you are getting it right in the V, the same trajectory as you use for the first cartridge. Otherwise, you're going to get your staple on staple. Uh, and uh, uh, many of us have had bad experiences with that situation. All right. And then last slide, I think. Oh, this is. Um, yeah. So this is, uh, you know, what um, it came back as papillary carcinoma. We always ink this staple margin here, uh, narrowly excised mass extends to three, three millimeters of surgical margin, which I think was the best we could do in this case. Unfortunately, that dog developed neurological signs five months post-op uh, and was euthanized. But um, uh, success, surgically, it was, uh, I think, a reasonably successful procedure. All right. Accessory lobe. We don't have to resect the accessory lobe very often, but you can do that through a thoracoscopic approach. Um, you know, you've got to do a little bit more legwork. You've got to come through the the um, 
uh, into the plural reflection by taking down the, that uh, plural reflection. You've got to be careful not to uh, sever the phrenic nerve when you do that. And of course, remember the accessory lobe has a pulmonary ligament attaching it. So you're going to have to take that down. It's a, it's a, and it's a double leaf. OK, so if, remember, you've got to go through both leaves of that, of that pulmonary ligament. And then what I do is, and I do this with open thoracotomy as well, I do what I call, for want of a better term, the cable flip. So you can either, you know, that, that accessory lobe um, falls down medial to the caver, which you just saw there a second ago, and you can either pull it out from underneath the caver or you can flip it up medial to the caver. And if you do that, you can get much tighter on the hyla. So if you have a tumor in there or more commonly, this was actually a foxtail case where uh, we had some consolidation of the accessory lobe associated with um, a foxtail or a plant or migration. Um, so we wanted to resect this lobe and um, we, we uh, uh, flipped that accessory lobe um, medially and that got us uh, that much closer to the pulmonary hilus. I do think with the accessory lobe, uh, but I kind of think this with with um, with open thoracotomy as well, it's a little bit harder to get really tight on the um, hilus of the accessory lobe, uh, but uh, I think you can probably do just as good of a job with the scope, um, but you just have to do a little bit more work to get to the point where you can think about the stapler being in place. So here again, you can see on this video uh, in a second here, we're opening up a nice big window. There's the cava, right? I've got my, uh, my uh, electrosurgical device leaning on the cava, and I can either take that lobe underneath the cava, ventral to it, but then my cava is going to get in the way, and um, I'm going to uh, get less of the accessory lobe that way. So I'm going to flip it medially and then start thinking about my positioning. And, and the keen-eyed ones of you out there will notice that I made a mistake here. Um, I put my stapler in and then I didn't follow my rule of visualizing the blue end of my stapler before I fired it. And actually, you can see that I got a few staples in the periphery of the caudal lobe, which is more proximal. Um, thankfully, that wasn't an issue. We reinflated that lung and we dripped some saline on there to make sure there weren't any leaks or anything. But that's a technical mistake um, associated with not looking at the both ends of the stapler before you actually fire it. It didn't have any consequences in this case, uh, but, uh, you know, not ideal technique. You can see the staples there just in the periphery of that caudal lung lobe. All right, lung lobe retrieval. You know, generally always want to put these in bags. Uh, for the most part, if you do big dogs uh, with significant lesions, you are going to find that they're too big for the bags. I mean, they do make very, very large bags for spleens and stuff in humans, um, uh, but uh, they become a little uh, a little impractical uh, because they're very, very large devices. So we do that sometimes. We also do this sometimes where we put the Alexis in. This was a lesion that was too big. Um, and uh, remember, you can get pretty big lesions out of small holes. So that's probably a four centimeter thoracotomy, and we've taken out a pretty big lesion through that hole. And again, I sort of feel okay about that because the Alexis wound retractor is giving me protection. It's allowing me a fairly friction, I wouldn't say friction free, but a low friction extraction. Um, I think less likely for me to shed cells into that um, incision and create the potential for, um, uh, for port site metastasis. All right, so I think with that, um, I am done. And uh, Chris, I don't know if you wanna take over and whether we wanna field any questions. Yeah. All right, yes, yeah, so um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And um, I mean, talking about lymph node identification, lymph node dissection is a very important part. I mean, you all know when you talk about lung lobectomies and lung tumors, I mean, it's one of the big part of the oncologic uh, principles and the staging of the patient is to first identify the lymph nodes and uh, hopefully identify the sentinel lymph nodes because that's usually the most important one to try to identify it and, and take a biopsy. So that's always one of the big concern here. And when I started to do lung lobectomies with thoracoscopy, I mean, if you know him, Steve Wisrow was here and he was always arguing with me, say, hey, how do you know you're getting the lymph nodes correctly? How do you see them? And it was a valid question and it's, it's a big concern when we do that. So. Originally, what we were doing is, um, of course, doing CT scans, and CT scans are great to identify tumors, see the size, but might give you some ideas of what lymph nodes may look abnormal. Doesn't mean an enlarged lymph node is necessarily a metastasis, but help us guide and um, for looking for lymph nodes 
and try to biopsy them during ceracoscopy. So that's a tool that I've used for quite a while. And then when you're doing your ceracoscopy, you can go first of all, if you have an obvious lymph node, like you can see on this image here on the top left corner, I mean, you can go with a biopsy forceps and uh, the basic five millimeter cup biopsy forceps will give you very good biopsies. Obviously, you need very good exposure. I mean, like here in this case, I mean, um, the dog was on one long ventilation. You can see this long lobe is well collapsed. The other one not completely collapsed there, but you're in between aorta and pulmonary arteries here. So what I do if I biopsy one of those lymph nodes, I usually ask the anesthetist, hey, can you stop your ventilator for 10 seconds? So at least I have no motion, just a heartbeat's there just to help me. And so you can take a pretty good decent biopsy in this area here, but obviously don't go blindly and make sure you visualize very well what you're getting. And here you have other examples here of lymph nodes uh, on the top image here. Uh, we had to dissect that lymph node that was underneath the zygous vein, obviously on the right side, we had resected the right cranial long, um, long lobe and uh, that lymph node was big and it was buried underneath that zygous vein, but we're able to dissect it. Here on this case, it was another lymph node that was into the cranial mediastinum, so, and it was in between the intercostal, uh, the internal thoracic arteries and veins, so we're able to go and dissect this big lymph node there and uh, turn out not to be a metastasis, but um, you can see a small, small one here, but the big one was right there. So we still dissected this thing out and extracted that, that lymph node. So those one, are fairly straightforward, fairly obvious lymph nodes to, to biopsy, and we should make any efforts, like when we do any open surgeries, to um, get biopsies of lymph nodes to get the best situation possible, at least the best diagnosis and the be best prognosis as possible for our patients. But when you look at the human side, I mean, it's really interesting to read the literature in the human side. First, in human, they do a lot of video assisted uh, thoracic uh, long lobectomies in human because of the anatomy and the way they do the procedures. But anyway, um, only three to 32% of long lobectomies that could be done with thoracoscopy are really done with thoracoscopy or, or video assisted thoracic surgeries. And if you read all those papers, I put a list them of some of those papers and there's even more recent one now, but doesn't matter, but their biggest argument uh, for not using a, a video assisted procedures or a sarcoscopy is, can we really see lymph nodes, okay? Can we really identify them? Can we really biopsy um, the important lymph nodes in our patient? Do we see only one side of the thoracic cavity? Can we see the other side? So a lot of question, a lot of arguments is going on on this, and that's what has been a big limiting factor in humans. I mean, the, the data that's coming out in the human side right now seems to show that it's pretty accurate and they get a pretty good idea of what's going on in those patients and are able to collect the appropriate lymph nodes. But the first study we did here to try to figure out are we getting appropriate um, lymph node biopsies in our cases, that was the goal of the study we published with one of our residents here, Dr. Bleakley, and we published that in 2015. And what we did in that study, we kind of took all the cases we did thoracoscopy, long lobectomies, and we matched those cases with dogs. We did similar surgery with thoracotomy, establishing the thoracotomy being the gold standard, thinking that with thoracotomy, we will not miss the important lymph nodes as, as accurate as that could be. And then we match our cases on the histology. So make sure we have the same type of lung tumors the same size, because size is a prognostic factor, like histology is a prognostic factor. And then we match them on lymph nodes biopsies. Did we get lymph node biopsy? Didn't we get them? And so would they, to be part of the matching and be part of the study, they had to have also a lymph node biopsy. And then the hypothesis was that if we match them, if we do the good job with thoracoscopy, which means we are really collecting the lymph nodes and we get the appropriate diagnosis here, we should have similar long-term outcome. So that was the idea of that whole study. And then when we looked at long-term outcome of our two populations, the thoracoscopy group being on the red line 
and the stratocotomy group being the blue line, you can see that over, I mean, three or four or five years follow up, but at least over the last, the first two and a half years, uh, you can see that the survival is exactly the same in between the two groups. So give me some confidence at the time, like, hey, we're not doing that much of a bad job with stratoscopy, at least identifying the lymph nodes, and we do at least as good as we can do it with stratocotomy. So that was our first indication and give me again some good confidence that we can keep going and keep doing this okay and so then looking at the human literature is how could they improve their chances of diagnosing and biopsying the sentinel lymph node and getting those lymph nodes they were using for a while um, radioactive agents and they were guided to ct to inject those radioactive agents in different lymph nodes, and then we're trying to find them through ceracoscopy with um, radioactive detection, uh, radioactivity detection during surgery. And it worked okay, but it was not very easy to work with, and there's a lot of safety issues related to the radioactivity in those patients. So they kind of quit doing this, or at least they don't do it as much. And now definitely, the big interest is going to fluorescence imaging. And I put here two books that came out, maybe now probably the last four or five years, and uh, basically showing the importance of all the fluorescence imaging you can do and how they can help the surgeon identify important structures, not only lymph nodes, but all kinds of different structures. But here for these topics is mostly identifying the sentinel lymph node. And so by using the correct agent, you can trace it. And if you pick the correct agent, it will go to the lymph nodes. And usually the first lymph nodes to show fluorescence is going to be supposedly the sentinel lymph node. And the nice thing about fluorescence, usually you can detect it into one centimeter uh, deep in the tissue. So that's pretty nice and very sensitive um, technique to use to detect lymph nodes. So how does that work? I mean, briefly, I mean, I'm not a physicist or whatever, but uh, if you have a molecule and you excite it with the correct wavelengths, that molecule is going to go into a state of excitation. And then when it goes back to the normal status, it's going to emit some light on the different wavelengths. And that's the whole principle of fluorescence. So if you correct, pick the correct wavelengths to, for excitation and the correct wavelengths for uh, observation, then you're going to visualize where this radio, this fluorescent substance is going. So here you have basically the images, how that thing is done. So you have to have a light source with a special filter that will give you the appropriate wavelengths to excite the molecule you're using. And then through your camera with a special filter again, you're going to see the fluorescent molecule that's going to be uh, going through the lymphatics for the purpose of that study that is going to go to the lymph nodes, okay? So that's the whole purpose of that. So that's a, a technique that is extremely uh, reliable, okay? And that's been now well uh, evaluated. And you have all kinds of systems that exist out there, okay? And there is probably more than this. I mean, that's the most common system that you're going to see with different technologies. Some of them use some laser light, some of those don't, okay? Some are approved, some of those are not approved to be used, but I think now all those devices here are just uh, being approved. You can even see one here. The Firefly is now available to be used on the Da Vinci robot, so it's going to some pretty advanced uh, procedure. But the, the equipment that I'm used to use is the equipment from car stores. They have a pretty good uh, light source uh, that's going to work extremely well for the type of uh, fluorescent agent that we are using. And the good thing I like about this technique is that it can be uh, used uh, for um, open versus uh, also um, laparoscopic or ceracoscopic technique. So you can use a regular endoscope that you can use during your ceracoscopy, or you can use an exoscope that you can use during an open surgery. So it's very easy to use and very versatile, and then you're going to get very nice images and help you identify your lymph node. So like I said, you have a huge variety of different fluorophores or fluorescent substance that you can use. Depends what organ you're trying to work, okay? And de depends also what maybe some tumor you're trying to target. So you can see 
Some of those have been um, well developed for some time brain surgeries. Some of them will go more specifically being screened through urine and be better maybe to detect tumors in the bladder. So you can see the whole list here of all those different substances that exist. The one I have most experience with and maybe only experience with right now, and I think it's pretty much what's going on in the veterinary world right now, is use endocyne and grain. For people that are old enough, endocyne and grain was used uh, maybe 30 years ago when we didn't do bile acids and it was used to use to evaluate liver function. So it's a, it's a uh, fluorescent uh, drugs that have been used for years and years for different reasons, okay? But um, it's a drug that is very well tolerated with very, very little toxicity. So that's why it's a very safe drug to use. And if you excite it at, uh, with 805 nanometers, which is infrared light or near infrared light, it's going to emit some light, some fluorescent light at this wavelength here, okay? And so there is all kind of different dosages we can use. I don't think in dogs we have established very well what dosages to use, but in human, that's kind of the classic dose of using it between 0.1 to 0.5 milligram per kilogram body weight for IV injections. And um, that's a nice thing about it. You can use injected IV and I'll show you some pictures that uh, Dr. Runge and Dr. David Holt gave me or what you can do with IV injections. What I've been using it mostly is for injection into the lungs and you can inject it into the lung lobe with a tumor and then let it diffuse through the lymphatics and see where you're going to see uh, fluorescence. If you inject it into IV, obviously it's going to bind to proteins and being uh, transported through the system this way, and then it's going to be excreted through the hepatobiliary pathways, which is another great application of this technology for cholecystectomies. It's not the purpose of the discussion today, but it's a great application of this technology. So if we come back to our primary lung tumor, I mean, uh, like the way I like to do it to help me stage my patient and identify um, the, the sentinel lymph nodes, I'm going to inject the endocyne and grain around the primary lung tumor. Okay, so I'm going to use a spinal needle like you can see here in this dog during thoracoscopy. I'm stabilizing the lungs with a grasping forceps and I have my spinal needle just at the bottom right corner here inject some uh, uh, endocyne and green, and you try not to let it leak outside, okay? And then we were looking around the hilus in this dog, and then within five minutes, I mean, you start to see a little bit of fluorescence here in between those long lobes, and again, you have aorta up here, pulmonary artery a little bit in between, and you can see as time is going on, this lymph nodes is getting more and more fluorescent. If you look at with reg regular lights, you don't see anything. I mean, you barely see there is a lymph node there, okay? So, and palpation, we could not really palpate anything. So now, give me some pretty good indication, hey, this lymph node is a sentinel lymph node. Looking at the CT in this dog, didn't show any big lymph nodes. We biopsied it, didn't turn out to have a metastasis, but was really helpful to uh, visualize it. Something that is important here, I'm mean, going to get this video going, is that that's what I've learned with experience, is trying to stabilize that long lobe as much as you can with a little grasping forceps like I do here. You want to try to minimize the motion of that long lobe while you do the injection, especially when you use one lung ventilation, the, the thickness of that long lobe is, is not much. And then if you inject some endocyanin green outside of the lungs, then it's kind of useless. So you can see here some example in the dog here where we injected the um, endocyne and green in the long lobe. And what was interesting in this dog, the first lymph nodes to show fluorescence was in the mediastinum. And you can see here on the left side with regular light, and then you can see here with uh, infrared lights, you can see those two lymph nodes showing up here. And they were absolutely not into uh, the hilus of those lungs. So, we would not have had this endocyne and green. We would have never seen those lymph nodes, or at least we would have never biopsied those. So that's something definitely that will be helpful. We don't have enough data right now to publish uh, anything about it, but um, definitely it's, it's helping. 
here is a case what you have to uh, be aware of is you can see here is the point of penetration of my needle. So a little bit of endocyanin green was deposited here. So it's you can see it was barely a drop of um, endocyanin green and you can see how fluorescent it is. And here you can see the line of resection. So some of the endocyanin green was probably getting into a bronchi and probably dripped into the main stem bronchi of that long lobe. So you can see that line of fluorescence here. It's nothing significant, okay, but that's something that can happen. But you can see behind here, you can see that fluorescence here at the hilus. And so more likely it's the lymph nodes collecting this, um, this uh, um, uh, endocyanin green in this patient. Here is a case where I was not careful enough and when I learned my lesson, uh, some of the endocyanin green leaked outside of the long lobe and went all over the pleural space. Give you beautiful images, but now you cannot figure out what is a lymph node, what is not a lymph node. I mean, we tried in this case to figure it better, but you get so much fluorescence, then it's kind of useless at that point. So you have to be very, very careful just to inject and you don't need much. I mean, you can see how a drop of, of uh, endocyanin green is very fluorescent here. So you don't need to take a risk and inject too much and get leakage. You can get some leakage also when you remove your needle. So you have to be careful, inject the endocyanin green, let your needle sit here for a few seconds. So at least the endocyanin green can diffuse into the parenchyma before you pull the needle out and the endocyanin green leaks outside, All right? So, we had cases where lymph nodes were not visible. Okay, I had a bunch of dogs where I could not get anything. So is it a problem with dosages? Did I give enough? Okay, did it go into the control lateral side? That's something we don't know and it's a big question in human and we don't know in dogs very well the lymphatics and the lymph nodes and the lymphatic circulation around the lungs in dogs. That will be a great research projects to do for some residents. And my biggest concern now is since we're using one long ventilation, is one long ventilation interfering with the diffusion of endocyanin green? I mean, doing some research um, and reading some literature in human, it's been shown that one long ventilation can interfere with lymphatic flow into the lungs, okay? So it has been shown that it's a big component with CPAP and any PEEP and whatever you use, but also one lung ventilation may have an effect on that. And that might decrease tremendously the flow of, of lymph into the, the lung. So that may interfere with the diffusion of endocyanin green. I don't know that, but definitely it's something that could happen and we need to be aware of that and some research has to be done with this. So, I mean, endocyanin green and, and, and near infrared lights is being used now a lot in oncology in humans to detect tumors, detect metastasis, or uh, to target specific tumors. Now in human, what they do is they have antibodies now that are where they bind the fluorescent substance to these antibodies. And this antibody is going to go and bind to the tumor and help them detect the tumors at a much smaller size. So that's where they are going in the human side there. Other application I already mentioned, um, that's a work that's done by Dr. Holt and Runch at, at, at Penn is um, they are using this to detect lung tumors, okay? So they are injecting the endocyanin green IV and those things may have to be injected maybe several hours before you do the sarcoscopy. Okay, there is all kind of different protocols out there depend the amount of endocyanin green you're injecting. But anyway, when you injected IV, then what is happening is around the tumor, probably there is leakage of the capillaries and the endocyanin green is going to diffuse to the tissue around the tumor or within the tumor by itself. And then if you come in with your endoscope, with your near infrared lights, you're going to see that little lung tumor being very fluorescent and being very obvious, okay? This is an image that Dr. Runge and David Holt gave me. That's part of their research there. And what they've done, they injected this endocyanin green intravenously. So, I mean, that will be a nice uh, help in the future to localize smaller tumors. And that's what 
fluorescence and infrared lights have been uh, have been developed. If you read those books that I've showed you, it's basically a bridge in between CT images to images you can see in surgery. So it's helping you translate what you see through CT to what you're going to see into the operating room. So it has some application there, okay? And basically, I mean, it's a huge, that's great potential. It's very user friendly. I mean, the toxicity, especially of endocyanin green is extremely low. And uh, the depth of penetration, I mean, it's at least a centimeter, which is fairly decent to me, but it could be a limiting factor if you have a lot of fibrosis in different conditions. So that's definitely something you need to be thinking about. It's used for other tumors. In human, they have been using it. I know it's outside lung tumors right now, but they've been using it for stomach tumors to find lymph nodes. It's been used for pancreas. There is some studies that has been published by Dr. Steffi uh, from Davis about um, iliac lymph nodes, and the big application is detect anal sac after anal sac tumors, detect uh, iliac lymph nodes. That's uh, cases I did where I injected here on the top left, I injected into the anal sac, and then I looked into the pelvic canal in those dogs, and you could see those lymph nodes lighting up one after the other within a minute or two after injecting it. So you can see them, and those lymph nodes were not iliac lymph nodes. They were inside the pelvic canal, they were pretty small, and you can see those nice lymphatics. Obviously, other application will be thoracic duct ligation. We're not the topic today. You can use it for biliary surgeries like uh, cholecystectomies and stuff like that with different filters you, so you can see extremely well the lymphatics, the common bile duct. So that's another uh, place of application of that. And just to give you an, an idea, I mean, if you do a little search in PubMed about photodynamic diagnosis, for example, I mean, you're going to get a huge number of publications. I mean, I found 7,438 publications there in the last maybe uh, 10 years in those cases. So you can see the huge amount of interest that's out there on um, uh, detection of lymph nodes and fluorescence images. So. That's what I have for today. So that's all I have for this presentation. So that's it. That's great. So I would say the last question we have here is when removing tumors using a specimen retrieval bag, do you tend to still get adequate margin assessment from histopath, um, especially if the tumor has been inadvertently squashed um, either during retrieval or getting it in there? And then um, any general recommendations on the incision that you make uh, for getting them out through the bag? Yeah, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I uh, I got to tell you, I, I do not, uh, and this is true for other pathologies as well, I don't like sending path um, a bag of mush uh, tissue. So I honestly, I make the, 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 the extraction incision big enough uh, so that I remove it without too much resistance. Now you can, you know, you can go nuts and you can keep that incision really small and struggle to get that tissue through the hole and stuff. And, uh, but you are giving the pathologist, you know, uh, potentially damaged tissue. Um, so I don't tend to do that. I tend to make my incision big enough, but you know, when you take things out in bags, uh, or using Lexus wound retractor devices, you can get substantial uh, masses out through relatively small incisions. It, it doesn't follow that if your incision on the CT is eight centimeters, that you need an eight centimeter thoracotomy to take out. And of course, different tumors are different sizes and shapes and what have you, but you can often get uh, substantial amounts of tissue in those bags out through relatively um, small incisions. And, you know, the big thing is if you avoid rib spreading, you're probably getting most of the advantage for the patient. Okay. So um, uh, in humans, at least, it seems like the rib spreading is the thing that gives people um, uh, most of their, uh, their post-operative pain. That's great. Um, and then another question, um, <clears throat> I'm kind of going to alter the original question a little bit, but um, the, the question was about using a vessel sealer. Um, and <clears throat> initially, I think it was for uh, kind of just general pulmonary hyalur sealing, but um, even for some of those smaller residual lung parenchyma, um, kind of after your staple line, do you ever consider using a vessel sealing device at that point? Yeah, you know, um, I haven't. I mean, 
we did a study a few years ago, look in live dogs doing peripheral um, peripheral uh, lung biopsies with the vessel sealer, and it was it was it was okay. You know, they all lived. They none of them leaked. Um, and but the but we were talking about a very peripheral um, removal of you know half a centimeter to one centimeter of the periphery of lung lobes, and it, it was okay. And that was normal dog lung. Um, you know, Eric's group did a study, a cadaveric study, showing that it, it wasn't an Eric, uh, you'll know the data better than I will, but um, that, you know, it, it, they failed at relatively unimpressive pressures. OK, so the take home message from Eric's study was be damned careful. Right. And that was also peripheral samples, Eric, correct? Yeah, still muted, Dr. Brunet. Yes, it was very. It was peripheral samples. I mean, we were two centimeters from the edges or three centimeters from the edges. So take a very significant biopsy and those things lead to pretty low pressure and very, very unpredictable. Yeah. So, I mean, I would consider, you know, we just don't get asked to do lung biopsies very often, right? But uh, I would consider it in a dog for a very small peripheral lung um, sample, but I am not brave enough to use a ligature on the hylus and, and I would definitely absolutely not trust a, a vessel sealing device to seal a bronchus, right? That's not what it's for. Um, it's not indicated for that. And, uh, you know, I would say that you would do that at your at your peril. Yeah, we have another question kind of similar, uh, but we're in cases where the cartridge does not completely um, occlude the lung. Um, do you ever use a single titanium clip or a hemolock? Yeah. I think that would be perfectly reasonable. Yeah, I would definitely consider that. OK, any uh, I don't see any other questions from the crowd. Um, do any other moderators, panelists have anything else to say? I, I have a question for Dr. Sanchez. Are you are you, are you still there? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, what do you guys think about double lumen tubes? Have you guys played around with those much or um, just, I mean, the, for me, the big indication is these right-sided cranial lobe lesions or, or any kind of right-sided lesion, just the ability to totally avoid that that kind of nightmare of the, cra of the cranial lobar bronchus on the right. Yeah, I agree. And that's why we started with the double lumen. Like originally, that was the the device that we use the most, and then we ran into trouble. I don't know if we don't have enough sizes because we're, we don't have all the sizes that are available. But we ran into three or four dogs in a row where the device was just too short. Yeah, and we got frustrated. Like in, in they were not gigantic dogs; they were like 20 to 25 kilo dogs, and the device was just too short. And then once you place it in, it's like that's it. Um, so we had to like switch to an ARN before we had the EC blocker, and I think that kind of frustrated us, and we stopped using it. And I know it's great for some things, but you know the length is still a big problem for us. And I don't know if our population of dogs are bigger. Or <laughs> no, I, no, I, I, we definitely had the same experience, and it's and it's interesting that it's there's definitely not uh, a, a linear relationship of of weight to tracheal length. I don't. Mm -hmm think because you know I've I've gotten double lumens into some 30 kilogram Labrador or Goldens and then same thing that you just said you get the odd 23 kilogram dog where the damn thing's too short you know um, and you like, can you stuff it way down room. the throat but you can't get that white piece past the larynx so that's the limitation right that was the other thing that small dogs the smallest size that we had the intubation was just because of what you said there's like that little piece at the end and in a small dog sometimes it was it was kind of traumatic to get it through so yeah. we had like the small dog problem and then the long trachea problem so we kind of moved away from it even though it's the first device that we got familiarized with so for some cases it worked amazing it's just that we found that there were too many dogs where either we couldn't feed it through the larynx or it was just not long enough so we kind of gave up on it yeah we just need a longer one <laughs> and I think, yeah, exactly. And I think in people, you know, there are disadvantages as well because it's a much rougher device on the mm -hmm. throat. And so people who have double lumen tubes, I think, have a much, they have a sore throat after surgery. And they're, you know, people have scoped after double lumen and they, they have, they can sometimes have 
uh, bruising and uh, hematomas in the wall of the airway and stuff like that. So it's definitely disadvantages. I just, we, I mean, uh, uh, and, you know, in our hands, the aunt works really well um, in, in really a lot of cases, you know, it's not a, it's, it's not a bad technique at all. It's a great technique. But for those cases where that damn thing won't sit in that little space between that cranial lobar bronchus and you want to do a lung resection um, and it always falls out and prolapses like you showed, uh, those are the frustrating cases where I feel like we need these other options to be on the table. Yeah, we do like it. The, the major problem for us was the scoping part. And I don't know if, you know, every institution is different with that, but we do need logistically, we do need medicine. We do need the tower in the room is like extra equipment plus all the equipment that you guys already have. So there was like a, a logistic problem with coordinating with medicine to come scope it, um, you know, so it, we still use it. I just really like the fact that, you know, with the EC blocker now we're placing it blindly so we don't depend on medicine to come and scope for us. So for that perspective, but for smaller dogs where you cannot feed something bigger than a six, we still use the small size of the arm. Um, and as Eric mentioned, with that one that is very small, you can even free, feed the scope through the tube and the device beside the tube. So for small dogs, it's the only one that we find that it works, just the, the pediatric version of the, of the arm. So we basically go for that for smaller dogs and then everything in between, we're using more the EC blocker now. Yeah, I mean, and for me, if you don't use um, if you don't use the bronchoscope, I mean, for me, using the bronchoscope is very important, no matter what kind of occluder, because you know how well you can see you know, bronchi. Mm -hmm. You can really see, and usually I put enough pressure in the balloon until I see the carina being deviated a little bit. Yeah. So since you do that, and usually I place the tube before we start draping the dog, and then by the time you have the patient all draped, if you have a good seat, the lungs are all deflated by then. So for yeah. me, no matter what tube you're using, I mean, not using bronchoscopy, it's sort of a bit of a gamble because if you don't seal it well, I mean, it's going to create all kind of problems. Which is like, we were actually surprised and we did this because, you know, uh, Dr. Mahu had some experience with the blind placement in the, in the cadavers. We started doing this really recently where we place the EC blocker blindly and it's the only one that you know where you are because it locks lodges the crina. So, you know, you feel that resistance when it lodges in and then you retract, you inflate and we're having a very high success rate and you can check exactly where you are with the fluoroscope. So it's the only device that I feel comfortable enough that I'm like, okay, I think I know where I am, but still, yeah, you, you never know where, know where you are. Where it's your, in, so. your insufflation of the balloon, it's kind of a guess. Yeah, yeah I agree. That's, I agree, like it's not perfect. Because I've seen cases where you get the opposite effect. If you don't insufflate enough your balloon, your ventilator push oxygen past the balloon, but it never comes back. And I've seen that happen where you get your lungs that are gigantic. Yeah, that has happened. And that's one of the reasons why when we do it blindly, we do not do anything until you guys have visualization of the lungs because we want to make sure that A, once that is in, in place is not moving because we don't have a bronchoscope down there to see what is happening. So you want to make sure that it doesn't move and you want to make sure that there is, you know, direct visualization of the lungs. So you're not even over inflating or the opposite. So, you know, there is no perfect technique. I think so far we're working on it. <laughs> Andrea, what is your experience? Because, you know, we did that cadaver study with the easy blocker and, mm -hmm. you know, it went really pretty well. And uh, the big thing, which you already mentioned, is that I wish we had a device because the, 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 the easy blocker falls onto the carina very easily, very repeatedly. This is mm -hmm. not a problem. It, it almost always locks onto the carina. The problem, and, and if we had a device, and we've talked about this before, that where we could just leave it on the carina, that'd be great, but we can't because the, that right cranial lobar bronchus is never blocked when you drop it onto the carina. So you have to pull it back, like you said. What has been your experience in the clinical cases? Because we've actually, uh, we've had more difficulty in our clinical cases than I think you guys have. And it, interestingly, and I haven't done that many, but interestingly, the ones that I've done in clinical cases have not gone as well as the as the cadaver cases. Uh, and that it seems to be that that backing it up 
is highly variable, which makes sense because our dogs are different sizes. But uh, uh, have you kind of got a clinical impression from the cases you've done? You know, yeah. Is it two centimeters? Is it four centimeters? I mean, I presume it's variable. So it's really variable. And that's why we do it in like steps. And that's what we're trying to figure out too with the results of this study, like how much do you have to withdraw? Because again, we had that same problem. If you don't move it more cranially, you're never going to get that right lobe the cranial one so what we find is when it's left side i don't i don't move it and it's perfect i just lodge in the crane and i'm right there if it's the right side we start retracting 0.5 centimeters at a time and i find that in small dogs most of them 0.5 centimeters is enough but in larger dogs sometimes you have to go up to two centimeters so i would say you know most of the dogs between 0.5 and 1.5 you'll get it in the big big dog sometimes you have to go two two and a half centimeters but again it's so variable that so far there is not a magic number what we do is we retract half a centimeter we inflate if nothing happens we retract half a centimeter we inflate again until we see some collapse and then we stop right there and doing that formula we've been pretty successful um, is that you have to start like I cannot say if you retracted 1.5 centimeters every time you'll get it. <laughs> like sadly, it's, it's super only. dependent on the size of the dog and the anatomy. Right. Um, I got a question for you, Eric. Um, what's your approach now to nodes? I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of us who are minimally invasive enthusiasts, you know, we 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 do we love to do lung stuff, but we have this chronic bad conscience about are we understaging these dogs? Uh, and honestly, you know, I try and pull nodes when I do thoracotomies, and certainly if they're big on the CT, I try and pull them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's it's arguably harder to to pull nodes with the scope. You know, the 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 right one is the straightforward one, the left one you know, is often buried under the pulmonary artery and is very difficult. Um, and the central one is, is you know, um, relatively easy to biopsy, but difficult to resect completely in my experience. Um, you know, are you, you know, we don't, what we, I feel like what we really need is, is correlation between CT um, and histopathology, which there's one small study. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen bigger studies. The suggestion was that the correlation was relatively good and that if your nodes were pretty normal in size, micrometastatic disease was not a particularly common finding. Um, and the vast majority of the primary lung lobe tumors that I see don't have lymphadenopathy. So what what's your like standard clinical approach now to these cases? Are you pulling, are you make are you trying your best to pull a node in every case? I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying as much as I can. Either if I can see them, or if I use um, endocyne and green, that's what I do uh, in each of those cases to try to biopsy at least what I think is could be the sentinel lymph node. And in your experience, let's say anecdotally, or maybe you've looked at the numbers, I don't know, but in your experience, uh, most of those little tiny ones, because some of those dogs, you know, their nodes are three millimeters, right? And and uh, are you finding micrometastatic disease in those nodes or have you had that happen? Oh yeah, we found some metastasis in those in those nodes, even if they don't look very large. So I mean, I don't have any numbers on top of my head. I mean, we haven't looked at that data yet, but um, yes, we we identified some lymph nodes that looks. Since we've been using endocyne and green, we can see some lymph nodes now that were looking normal. You biopsy them, and there's something in there. I don't have any numbers to tell you how often, but because uh, yeah. we haven't done it enough, but um, that's something I started to do now for the last two years. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a big area for me that we need way more information on. Um, and does my does cool also is to use this endochameleon now the scope with a different angle, so you can really look around the hilus very nicely. So that's definitely very helpful. But you can use it only in big dogs. I mean, it's a 10 millimeter scope, so it's huge. But it's been very helpful. Yeah. I mean, that's a big question for me. And, and also, you know, does micrometastatic disease make a huge difference to prognosis? Because that's, we don't know that, right? I mean, in breast cancer, in humans, micrometastatic disease doesn't necessarily change the prognosis uh, for the patient, but it might it might upstage, it might cause them to be upstaged and and uh, it might change change adjuvant therapy and stuff like that. 
Um, but it's it's uh, it, it's not that easy to do in every case. That is something that we're looking at um, currently, actually, in terms of uh, evaluating the uh, lymph node, uh, not only micrometastatic disease, but macrometastatic disease uh, and how that affects outcome. But I similarly don't have the numbers yet. Oh, Chris, disappointing. I thought you were about to tell us the answer to all our questions. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Good, good. Yeah, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's multiple groups working on that. I'm sure we'll have good good data on that at some point soon. Great. Um, all right, uh, we, we definitely went a little bit over time and it looks like we are losing some of our attendees, but I uh, want to thank all of the panelists for for joining us today. Um, and again, just another shameless plug. Um, this is something that VES is definitely planning on doing um, more frequently. This is something that will likely be specifically for members in the uh, potentially not too near future. And so um, if anyone does have questions about joining VES, if you have questions about um, the process or um, just want to be a member, please reach out to me and I will be sending out a post webinar survey to everyone that registered just for uh, more information about topics that you would like to see timing in terms of when throughout the day or throughout the week this may be best. Um, and then again, interest in terms of uh, member benefits from VES in the near future. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much, everybody. Yep, thanks, everybody. Thank you. recommend in terms of uh, Lexus wound retractors that you've needed for these assisted cases. In regards to like the size of the Lexus wound retractor, is that what you mean? Yeah, just what you found that you need to keep in stock. So, uh, so really we keep two in stock. So there's like a smaller one, which is like the two to four, and then there's the larger one. And so we keep both, um, but that's because we use the Lexus in multiple different situations. Um, really, you know, and also I guess like size wise for the for the patient, like you've, if you've got that wiggle room. So if we keep, I'd keep the two sizes in for sure. Okay, and uh, Dr. Sanchez, if you want to share and brought it up just because um, this is something that um, I know we discussed uh, previously at my last institution as well, but um, mm -hmm. what do you recommend in terms of um, allowing either passive collapse or active suction um, after you uh, have placed these devices? So ideally, I always allowed for passive collapse first because you will cause less damage. Like there is always the question of how much suction can you do without damaging the tissue, right? So the safest thing to do will be passive collapse and sometimes they collapse quite quickly. So that's it, you don't have to bother. But we've had cases where we are sure the device is in the right place, we allow time and it's not collapsing, not collapsing, not collapsing. And, and then most of the times we just do small, like gentle suction to help. But I would say if you can do passive, it's always better. It's gentler for the, for the tissue and for the lungs. That's great. And do you have any specifics in terms of pressure or volume that uh, you shoot for? For the if, suction, you mean? Yeah, if you do end up doing suction. We usually do manual because I, I find that we can, you know, titrate it better. So with the mechanical suction, sometimes I'm always scared that we may do too much. Um, so we usually attach a syringe and we do it manu manually. And I cannot tell you exactly the rate, but we usually attach like a 60 cc syringe and we do like a full syringe over a couple of minutes slowly so that the surgeon can give you feedback that is, is working, is collapsing at the same time that you don't do a lot of resistance when you're pulling. But there is no study that says, you know, this is the right suction to do or don't overcome this pressure. Like there is nothing much. So it's more mostly based on, on personal experience and what it works for us. And then uh, another question actually from uh, Monet, but um, what about uh, adding PEEP when you do one lung ventilation? Yeah, we don't commonly use it because we don't, I mean, we do have PEEP valves and there are some studies that have, you know, shown that the oxygenation gets improved. But to tell you the truth, our patients usually do so well without the PEEP that, um, you know, the PEEP can have some cardiovascular side effects that maybe 
well, most of the it depends on what PIB you're using, but I think because you're going to somehow decrease venous return, sometimes we try without. And then if we're having problems with oxygenation, then we think about maybe adding a little bit of PIB to try to improve that PO2. If the, if the surgeon says they really need the one lung and, you know, they'd rather try something, we add it. But I would say commonly we don't start with the PIB, we try without it. And I would say around 80% of the dogs do great without the PIB. Okay, thank you, Dr. Monet. We do have a couple questions for you. Uh -huh. uh, and in the meantime, Dr. Mayhew, if you want to um, share your screen, we can get that switched over. Um, so questions for you, Dr. Monet. Um, first one was, what do you think are the main limitations to performing the lymph node biopsies without fluorescence? I mean, the, the biggest limitation without fluorescence is it's give you a guidelines maybe where he is the sentinel lymph nodes, okay? And that's for me the big interest for that is I'm getting more confidence that I'm getting to the sentinel lymph nodes. And like the example I showed you, some tissue we are looking at didn't look like the lymph nodes and definitely the fluorescence was accumulating there. So give me greater confidence I'm getting the appropriate tissue. Um, and then another question, uh, was it appeared from the video that one of the videos that you posted um, that your injection was distal to the occlusion of the lobe um, and it didn't seem to affect the fluorescence. Uh, do you have a recommendation as to where within the lobe and in relation to the tumor that you make your injection? Yeah, I mean, I was not occluding the lobe. I was just holding a little bit the long parenchyma. So you, I usually inject around the tumor um, and uh, I think you can inject wherever you want in the same long lobe, but no, I was not squeezing the long lobe. I was just holding it stable so it could circulate normally. So I inject, I usually I inject around the tumor. I don't know if there is a specific site that could be better than another, but I've done some where I injected in the tumor by itself and didn't see much diffusion there. So now I'm injecting just around it. That's great. Thank you. The, the videos are great. Um, we will go to Dr. Mayhew now. Um, 